problem session. And uh, this is Ken Clarkson visiting us from IBM Research Hall. Thanks. Thanks for uh, the, the invitation to speak. Um, this is joint work with uh, Shashanka Ubaru, also at IBM, and Elizabeth Yang, who did this as a summer intern at IBM uh, while she was a student here, here at Berkeley, and she's now at OpenAI. So I, I have the bad habit of uh, starting out talks with apologies, and I, I'm still going to indulge that bad habit in that I just, so there's not much algorithm design here, it's all analysis. Um, it's things that you you actually already know a lot about um, uh, in dis, in a little bit of disguise, um, and so I just I just want to set expectations appropriately low. But uh, now, having done that, I will uh, I will then tell you first of all what what this is about. So there's at least there's a a, a small group of people who work on something called vector symbolic architectures, or uh, now now also called Hyperdimensional computing. Um, it's not a it's not a big group in terms of the people uh, in terms of you know machine learning and so on, but it's still relatively large, maybe compared to the the theory community. Well, maybe smaller than the theory community, but comparable, I would say. Um, and and what these are about, uh, if you boil it down in, in the terms that, that as as we would talk about them is that there are ways of just representing discrete sets using a single vector um, and uh, on which that single vector you can do membership testing. And then there's a bunch of uh, operations that you can do on, on that vector or on two vectors. So bundling, binding, and permuting. And first of all, you, you can uh, represent a discrete set with a characteristic vector of that set. So this is not you know, innovative in that sense. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, this particular representation has some advantages and has a, a simple direct relationship with characteristic vectors, as, as, I'll, as I'll talk about in, in the next uh, slide or two. So, so the setting here is that we have um, a set of discrete elements, and let's say they're just the integers from 1 to d, just you know, number the elements. And that's, that's what we regard as the ground set. And we're going to be looking at uh, trying to manipulate subsets of that ground set. And then we have, uh, for some dimension m, we have the, the atomic vectors of the, of the vector symbolic architecture, the VSA, for one particular uh, flavor or of, of uh, vector symbolic architecture called map i, the atomic vectors are sign vectors, uniform, random, plus, plus one, minus one vectors. Um, and, and we have then um, d of them. So we have you know, d sign vectors, in, in M dimensions. And, and starting with those sign vectors, we can do these operations on them, which are in the case of map I, bundling, which is just adding them, uh, binding them, which is doing element-wise multiplication of them, and uh, permutation or rotation of them. And I'll basically just talk about one flavor of this, which is um, just kind of rotating, you know, so that the first element becomes the second, the second becomes the third, and then the last becomes the, the first, um, unless it's in the other direction in the way that I defined the rotation matrix uh, in this case. But in any case, it's a, you know, one version of, of this kind of operation would be to just multiply by a matrix such that you're doing kind of a, a permutation of the coordinates of, the, of, of whatever vector you're, you're operating on. So, so there are these, these operations um, which there's, for, for different VSAs, there's different kind of atomic vectors different versions of bundling, bindling, and permutation, um, or, or in some cases, you know, it, it doesn't quite make sense to have binding operations, let's say. So, so there will be a subset of these operations, and, and they, these, these operations have, uh, you know, kind of very simple properties that, as, as you might expect, but one thing that's, that's needed in these is a, is a sort of a similarity, a notion of similarity for, for two vectors, which in our case would just be if their dot product is, is large enough, and I'll leave what large enough means uh, to be defined um, later. So as it happens, you know, as you well know, two sine vectors in sufficiently large dimension have a, have, will be approximately orthogonal to each other with high probability, or just it's sufficient for, for now to just say that they're with high probability unlikely to be similar to each other. So, or, with high, no, sorry, with high probability, they will be dissimilar to each other. So um, we, we have this kind of blessing of dimensionality in the sense that we have these high dimensional vectors that are 
pairwise, um, nearly uh, orthogonal to each other. So the, the, the kinds of conditions that we, that, that we want to have for these VSA um, algebras are, you know, commutativity and associativity of, of the bundling and binding operators, um, or that, that was certainly true in the case of map I in the case of the particular scheme that I, that I just described. Um, the binding distributes over bundling. Um, two vectors, uh, X and Y, are similar to the bundle of X and Y, so, you know, that the dot product of X with X plus Y is, is large enough for, for our purposes. Um, no, none of the vectors that we consider will, will be typically uh, similar to the binding of two vectors. And there's a, uh, a, an operation that in general is unbinding, but in the case of map I is simply you know, just multiplying, just binding with one of the vectors again so that you can sort of trivially recover um, each, each of the two vectors in the binding by binding again with one of those vectors. So you bind again with X and you get Y, you bind again with Y, you get X. So, so these, these simple operations then allow you to, you know, basically implement various data structures um, uh, it's a very simple data structure. So, so sets, which are subsets of, of the integers from one to D, where you just bundle them by taking the, uh, the bundle over all of the members of, of the set um, of the, uh, you take the bundle over all of those of their corresponding atomic vectors. So for each, each member of the set, there's, a, there's an atomic vector. Um, you can do insertion by bundling with the appropriate atomic vector and you do membership test using this uh, similarity operation. You could also have a, a set of, of unordered sets, let's say just a set of unordered pairs, you know, so in general, uh, bracket D choose N, but let's say N is equal to two. And in that case, you could represent it as a bundle of bindings and then recover um, for, for N equals two, you would recover, uh, you know, one element of that, of that, of, of one of those bindings by binding with the other one. So you, so SI times this representation of that whole bundle of bindings ultimately uh, comes down to uh, SJ for I and J in, in this, in this set ultimately comes down to SJ plus a number, a, a collection of of bundles and bindings and so on that if you are looking for that, that uh, constitute sort of noise when, when you then take the dot product with SJ to check that SJ is similar to, to, this, uh, to this expression. So this is, I mean, this is a, a, a lot to read maybe, but it's just distributing the, the, um, the binding over the bundling and then applying this, this fact about this simple fact about the, the bind, a binding twice uh, amounts to a multiplying by the identity. And finally, you could you can represent an ordered list of, of of entries by doing a bundle of rotations of each one of the corresponding uh, atomic vectors, um, and then be able to check membership in the list at a given position by doing a kind of an unrotation and then checking that you have similarity at that point. So, uh, what's the point of all this? Um, um, so, it, it is a way to do. Um, to, to have a, you know, particularly with the bundle of bindings, to do a kind of distributed associative memory. It's unlike characteristic vectors, let's say, it's robust to errors. Um, it's amenable, they tell me, to in-memory computation. Some versions of it are related to um, mod vectors, you know, the, uh, co uh, computations that, that, are, that seem to arise in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in some, some uh, models of neural networks. Um, and, and I would say actually, so there's a, the Redwood Institute here on the Berkeley campus um, is, is kind of the ground zero, so to speak, of, of this kind of work. And, and their interest in it comes, I think, from the sort of biological inspiration, et cetera. Also, as I'll, as I'll mention, it's related to um, Hopfield networks, classical Hopfield networks, as, as I'll described. And, and actually, you know, doing this kind of thing also comes up in spread spectrum wireless. Um, so are there any, are any questions or comments at, uh, at this point? Just to see, anybody okay? Go once. Um, 
so, so, so a way to, to look at this, which um, actually you were probably already, uh, you know, assuming or guessing is, is, well, that suppose you take these D atomic vectors, the M dimensional atomic vectors, and you arrange them as columns of a matrix. So they're sine vectors. And so now you have a sine matrix. And if you were to multiply that, that, uh, that matrix suitably scaled by the characteristic vector of a given set, that is to say, the character, so you're just picking out the appropriate columns and adding them up. Then in, in the map I algebra, what you end up with is the, is, you know, the bundle that represents that set. So, so the, the VSA representation of a set is just the sketch of its characteristic vector, uh, you know, the characteristic vector of that set. Um, so, so VSA is just kind of sketching in, in very, very light disguise. Um, so I, I also will, will need to kind of introduce an S bar, which is this, this appropriately scaled version of, of S because sometimes it's, it's nice to be able to, to, to uh, have things appropriately scaled in terms of various statements you'd want to make. Um, and when D is much larger than M, when the size of the ground set is, is very large, then this is a kind of compression. It's a, it's a way of compressing the characteristic vector um, in, in D dimensions down to, to M dimensions and then be able to do oper set-wise operations that are um, uh, uh, kind of uniformly done on all of the elements of the, all of the entries of the resulting vector and, and for which it's, it's also possible to kind of recover from local errors and so on. So that the, this is a robust representation in that sense that if you change one entry of a vector, it's still, you know, it's still going to be similar to the things that it was similar to before. So, so it's, it's robust to error to, to local errors in that sense. Um, so that, that membership test then, then translates into to, you know, it's a dot product and now I put in the scaling so that the upshot of this is just looking at the, the you know, using sketching to estimate the, the matrix vector product of the ith natural basis vector and the, and the characteristic vector V. So you're just doing approximate uh, vector vector product, you know, uh, uh, approximate matrix multiplication by way of sketching. So, so this is, you know, you, you know, I'm, I, I'm sorry to bore you, but but it it, it is it is uh, at least of some interest to simply be able to say that the um, that this you know this this scheme is it can can be uh, directly analyzed and some some aspects of it just you know it's it's analysis just read off from from standard things in in uh, in in the theory of sketching. So. So kind of more, more generally than membership test, we could also look at um, the, looking at estimating the size of the intersection of two sets or the symmetric difference of two sets. And that naturally translates into a sketching based estimate of the dot product of the characteristic vectors of the two sets or the uh, sketching based estimate of the Euclidean norm of the two sets. Okay, and the, the basic question of analysis here is, what is the what is a dimension sufficiently large so that you can do these membership tests and do these uh, set intersection queries uh, with with given you know with guaranteed accuracy um, with high probability um, and 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 our work is is basically a a follow up to work by um, Thomas Dasgupta and Rosen um, who looked at set membership and who. Um, used used similar you know the, uh, the incoherence terminology and so on that we that has also been you know a way of talking about sketching and JL and so on um, and the the contribution here is to kind of extend their work in particular to extend it to to set intersection and so on and and try to be as comprehensive as we could about uh, the analysis of of different different VSAs. So, okay. All right, and I will. There's there's a there's a lot of text here, but this is this is things that you're pr probably all very familiar with. First of all, that that the reason why this works is is kind of generalizations of JL. You know, so we're 
uh, Johnson Linda Trust ran a projection. So we have this, we can, we have uh, estimates for how big, how much error there's going to be in using this sketching based estimate of the dot product where it comes up with an additive error that's, it's epsilon times the norm of one characteristic vector times the norm of the other characteristic vector. And that translates to um, uh, an expre expressions in terms of the cardinalities of the sets. So a, a, a characteristic of, this, of, the, of these VSAs is that they can have ground sets which are extremely large, but nonetheless, the, the actual sketching dimension necessary is going to be uh, dependent on the, uh, the, the, the cardinalities of the sets that are being manipulated. And, and as, as most of you probably know already, the, the, a, a kind of starting point for the analysis of, of JL is to show that it, it preserves the norm of a, of a single vector. So the, if, you know, you, suppose you have some sketching distribution so that the squared norm of P times Y is equal to one plus or minus epsilon times the squared norm of Y. So say that that, that satisfies single vector norm preservation then from it, you know, using a union bound, you get you get uh, uh, preservation of norms of of many vectors, uh, preservation of norms of differences of vectors as as JL is traditionally expressed, uh, preservation of dot products of vectors using a little bit of uh, high school algebra, and so on. And as you all know, probably mostly that that you know, there's nothing particularly special here about the the sign matrices that um, you know independent subgaussian entries are also sufficient to have similar bounds for this norm preservation at least let's not worrying about the binding and uh, and so on for now um, you could also use uh, sparse JL um, as as Jelani and Daniel Kane uh, described for for the particular case of of of, of, of binding and of, of bundling. And also, can, could you, one can also use um, uh, subsampled randomized Hadamard transforms. So, so various either more sparse or uh, with fewer bits uh, schemes can be used instead of IID, you know, sign matrices. So, um, so this this already is something that the particular VSA community was not was not, I think, uh, cognizant of. Um, Okay, and and I and I have to say that that the you know in this analysis of of bundling that I'm it's really kind of a special case because well if you take the union of two sets, um, then you know something that's in the intersection should only be represented once, and if you add two characteristic vectors, then things that are in, in the intersection kind of are doubled up, and so you know if you if you were in an online setting in which you were bundling and bundling and bundling different different uh, atomic vectors or different vectors representing different sets then you know if you if you repeat yourself if you, you have a, an element represented more than one time so that you're really representing a multi-set then you know this kind of analysis doesn't you know doesn't quite tell you what you what you want it to tell you um, so this is just kind of in the offline setting but but still it, you know the, the results also do apply for these arbitrary sequences of bundles um, for the for the purpose of membership testing, because you just want that to be you just want the dot product to be large enough. You don't care how much larger it is. Um, so things are a little more interesting when we look at uh, bundles of bindings. And in this case, the one way to express the situation is that you uh, take the the original sign matrix and for every pair of columns to make a new column which is the the binding of those two columns that is the element wise product of those two columns and that constitutes a, a, a new uh, a, a new column so you have um, for you know for uh, for n equals two or k equals two as I use using here for sets for little or unordered sets of size two you, you would then have d choose two columns um, which if it if it helps anybody, um, this is a kind of a, you take the Khatri Rao, the, the, the row-wise Khatri Rao product and, and then eliminate uh, identical uh, uh, columns, and, and this, is, this is what you get. So, so now you have a, a much bigger matrix that is, uh, does not have um, IID columns, um, although rows continue to be uh, uh, IID, independent of each other. Um, and, and one of our results is just that if you, 
if you do the, if you look at sort of the norm preservation question for this for this uh, matrix that you've blown up to this extent, then you 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 know with subject to uh, you know some some log factors, you continue to have this norm preservation property, which means that all of the other properties, you know, all of the other operations that you want to do in terms of set intersection and set difference and so on, that that those continue to apply in this case. So, so the, the analysis here is, is at least not just reading off what was already in the prior literature. It's, um, uh, 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 you know, it's a, it's a little bit harder because we don't have independence of, of the columns, but, you know, we, we use, it's not that, not particularly difficult that we can simply use, um, you know, McDermott's inequality in, in places that we might otherwise use Bernstein's, let's say. Um, so it's, it's not too painful uh, uh, an analysis to do this. The, you, one could also view this as just a, a, another kind of result in which, you know, I guess the, the, um, the, an initial version of this would be to just look at k-wise independence for a very small amount of additional randomness. This is, this is reducing the amount of randomness for, you know, in, in, in one particular way to, and, and showing that even with that reduced randomness, um, you still have, you know, you still have the appropriate sketching properties. So, um, you, you know, the, so bundles of bindings can, can be analyzed in this fashion. Um, rotations can also be analyzed. And, and here again, we, we, we can think of it as constructing a, a very large uh, uh, sketching matrix by taking successive rotations, you know, so we start out with some sketching matrix S bar, rotate it, Take the squared rotation and so on up to up to some number of rotations, and then and then for a given sequence we of of characteristic vectors we put them all together and now we can encode that sequence of sets as a as a uh, sketch of that very large kind of characteristic vector. Okay, so so putting things things in in those terms we again can can put it in terms of uh, single vector, uh, proxim, you know, single ve uh, uh, norm preservation for for single vectors with all of the other properties that then that then follow um, for uh, again with a with a probably not the best possible L squared here where we're where we're encoding a sequence a sequence of length L um, and, or if we have if we have a particular condition in terms of the the number of times that a given element occurs anywhere in, in one of these sets, we can, and that, that's bounded by some value K, then we have a bound that's in, that's, that's with respect to this, uh, to, to, in terms of K. So, so again, this is uh, a little bit of a tweak on, on the usual analysis because, because of this lack of independence that we have in these, uh, in, in these matrices. Okay, so, so that was one kind of, uh, VSA, and I will kind of describe a what is actually a, a novel sort of sort of VSA that's in terms of um, uh, what's called a classical Hopfield network. So there's classical Hopfield networks and modern Hopfield networks, and the classical Hopfield network, which I'm which I'm discussing here, basically to put it in terms that 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 I that you know I can understand or that seem to be simpler than than what was described, you know, back when, it, which is that if you, um, the, the result of training such a network is, is, a, is the Gramian of a, of a sign matrix. So it's S times S transpose where, where S is a sign matrix. Or at any rate, this, that's the kind of matrix uh, for which the, the capacity analyses of hot field networks was, was done um, back when in, 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 in uh, ancient times. So I'm, um, one thing we have here is simply a, an analysis in a, in a fairly direct terms, you know, sim, you know, quote unquote, simple terms of, of something that was done a while ago. It does feed into later things, but it, it's a little bit of, um, because it's their kind of, kind of analysis. But um, the, while, while hot field networks are usually discussed in terms of Iterative processes in which there's an energy functional and you're and you're moving toward local minima of the energy functional. You can also just look at it in terms of, of matrix operations, 
in which you, you say, well, suppose you, you have some vector y, which is a sine vector, except that some, some entries are zero. And, and it's the case that the, the sort of normalized dot product of that vector y with one of the columns of, of this sine matrix is, uh, is, is big enough. Then, then if you, if you um, take the product of SS transpose and then but subtract off kind of some nuisance uh, diagonal terms, take the product of SS transpose with y and then take the, the sine of that uh, as appropriately defined, then with, uh, with high probability, you will, will, will recover um, uh, you know, that, that column S, SJ. So um, in, in terms of the way hot field networks are usually discussed, this is, this is one iteration of a process that then continues. But, but, in, but in, in fact, you can, you can get a simple guarantee of this sort after sort of one iteration of the process. So that this is this is not um, the most interesting version of of uh, Hopfield uh, network recovery uh, results in the sense that um, it's it's considered more interesting by people in the field to remove a log factor and have more errors. So the you get a bigger capacity, um, but in in terms of the number of number of different column vectors you can have, but um, but uh, you know, allow some errors in, in the actual recovered result. So, so this is a, the, the fact that you have zeros in here means that you, that would be a kind of erasure of those coordinates. And, and also, you know, if you have an error in which you take a, a minus one and make it plus one or vice versa, then that's going to reduce that dot product. Um, but, but erasures are less harmful because the erasures also reduce the norm of Y. So, so they have less effect on, you know, you can have more erasures and still keep that normalized dot product sufficiently high. So this, um, you know, the, it's, so, so this has a, um, uh, actually has a relation to map I in the sense that if you split one of the, split the column vectors up into two equal size pieces and look at the, the Gramian that you get, then there's a diagonal of that Gramian which will be the, a bundle of bindings uh, of those of those two different pieces considered across the, the the different columns. So there's a kind of a direct relationship between uh, between hot field networks of this sort and 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 the map I VSAs. Okay. So so just as a matter of notation, um, there's you know you could have a you translate a given vector to the diagonal version of that vector by filling in the diagonal entries with the entries of the vector. Um, and then here's an actual new algorithm, um, which we're calling Hopfield uh, plus or minus, um, a little bit in emulation of all those things called plus plus. This is plus or minus. And, and uh, I, I would, yeah, you, you could also call it Hopfield you know, PM if you were using kind of the LaTeX notation. So it's sort of evening Hopfield, if you like, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, sorry, but uh, the the thing is that that uh, where does where does where does the plus or minus come from? It comes from a a sine vector that you uh, you diagonalize, and then if you take a characteristic vector and diagonalize that, and then look at you know so you're sort of inserting a given a given vector. Uh, time, you know, element-wise product with a with a sine vector in between the the you know the s bar and the s bar transpose of, that you would use to get the Gramian, and if you do that, then you have this norm preservation property, as with these uh, these other cases, um, uh, with with these prior things, and and the the my the somewhat interesting thing about this is that the dependence on m is such that. Um, you, you can use an, an M by M uh, hot field plus or minus network to represent a set, to represent a bundle, um, uh, uh, represent as a bundle in, in, in this sense, a, a set which is um, of, of uh, 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 you know, what you would need for a, a, a VSA vector of dimension M squared. So, so the, the capacity of a hot field network with this, with the addition of this plus or minus business, for the purpose of representing uh, a set, 
is, is actually no less efficient than, um, than other VSA representations. So, so there's, there's two different, this is using a hot field network for something that it is not commonly, commonly uh, used for, which is, which is representing sets as bundles in this way. But the thing is that with a little bit of tweaking with this plus or minus, we get, we get something which is, uh, which, is a, which is relatively efficient for, for the purpose. Okay, so so that uh, well, and now I have not too much time, but th th that concludes the 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 um, the different VSAs or VSA adjacent uh, operations that for which this business about the norm preservation implying all the other things um, is 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 useful because because he, from here on that things are are more nonlinear, so it looks more less like sketching and more like you know sort of uh, data structures or or Boolean function analysis. So in, in map B, um, the, the, the uh, vectors that are manipulated are sort of more co compactly expressed because we, we take the sign of, 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 of the sum of the, two, of the vectors to make a bundle. So, so and, and the sign here is of a particular form so that you know, it's, if, if, if the given value is greater than zero, then it's one, less than zero, it's minus one. And we flip flip a coin if it's if it's actually equal to zero. So that that enforces um, in a in an unbiased way that we always have plus ones and minus ones. Okay. So so there what we have shown is is how how big a a sketching dimension is needed in order for this kind of uh, operation in order to you know so our 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 offline bundling is to take. The, that exact same sign matrix multiplied by the characteristic vector, and then take the sign of that, and the and the upshot is that there's you know that that there is an an, an a sketching dimension m, a, a an atomic vector dimension m, um, which is which is uh, n if we want to represent n entries such that we can do um, at least a membership in map B. Um, with this particular test that the, this is the similarity test, which is the dot product has to be, you know, that big. Um, and we also have results for rotations and bundles of bindings in a, in a restricted setting. So um, this is, uh, you know, be, because if we, if we kind of look at a given entry for that membership test, what we get is the, the sign of SV, the ith entry of, of, that, of that vector, times S I J if we're checking, checking for, um, for, for the Jth column being, being a member, for J being a member, then we can push that sign uh, that the, the multiplication inside the sign and then uh, pull out the particular entry for, for K equals J. And we get that we're looking for the, at the sign of one plus some, some terms that, that are a sum of, of, IID um, uh, sign Rademacher random vectors. Okay, so so basically it's just it's analysis that becomes a question of is that sum equal to minus one, equal to equal to greater than minus one, less than minus one, and it becomes a little bit of a case analysis in terms of of whether n is even or odd, um, but it's not too far from the analysis as in you know B B Boolean uh, function complexity of the um, uh, uh, of the majority function. And we had a little bit of hope that more, more of that Boolean function analysis goodness might enter in here, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to. Um, one, one point here is that if, if instead of doing the bundling all at once in the kind of this offline way, if you, if you take a given uh, atomic vector, bundle with it, then take another one, bundle with it, take another one, bundle with it. So, you know, iterate in that fashion. And so we have this kind of nested series of, of, uh, of sign, add and take the sign, add and take the sign, add and take the sign, looking at just M equals one, looking at just, you know, one, one number in each case. Then the, the sort of the signal, which is, um, you know, can, can we detect that the first atomic vector, the atomic vector we started with, can we detect that it's in that bundle, that the signal kind of dies exponentially fast. So the probability that we'll even be able to tell that we'll get any difference for that is, is one half. It's a coin flip plus one over two to the R, a tiny bias in favor of being able to tell 
that X1 is, is in that bundle. So, so this, um, you know, just as an observation about the, the relative weakness of map B, this was actually already known to uh, Dennis Clayco and, and, and co-authors uh, here at the Redwood Institute. Um, uh, but what they also noticed is that um, if, you, if you clip not down to one, but if you sort of do something intermediate between map I and map B and you, you clip to small integers, then you continue to have that kind of decay, but it, it, it occurs much less rapidly. So you have a kind of uh, moving average, which is, which is done in a, in a nonlinear way, which is kind of an interesting, interesting construction, I, I think. Um, and finally, um, bloom filters uh, are, are, are actually an instance of, um, and, and which were sort of de de defined independently within the VSA community. Um, our bloom filters can be interpreted as, as VSAs, where here you, you generate um, a binary vector. The atomic vectors are uh, binary vectors that are zeros or ones when you have some K non-zero entries. Uh, out of out of M, and um, and then the, the you construct a sparse binary matrix with each, each column being generated in that fashion independently, so that then a a counting bloom filter, as it's called, would be the the product of such a, vec a matrix B times the characteristic vector, um, and a bloom filter would be uh, the the coordinate wise minimum with one of 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 B times V. In that same fashion, so you're clipping, clipping down to down to one these these positive values down to one. So this is this is kind of in the of course in the in the offline setting, and there's a similar operation in the in the online setting as you as you would expect for these. And I should counting bloom also is is sort of an unstructured version of the uh, of the count min sketch. Now, um, it, it, okay. Um, just one last thing here would be an, that, that what we have is an analysis of set intersection for, for, um, vec for vectors representing two different sets, and um, which apparently has not been done for bloom filters, which kind of surprises me. So if you, you, know, if you happen to know where somebody did this, um, please let me know. But um, the, the, the way in which you can, you can use bloom filters in, the, in this way is to first of all have a function which sort of accounts, uh, compensates for the collisions that you will have as you have more and more members of this set relative, you know, you will have collisions, meaning that, you know, you'll have a, a, a non-zero entry in, in, in this binary vector, sparse binary vector, a non-zero entry in this other sparse binary vector, and they're actually at the same coordinate. So they collide in that sense. And so the, the number of non-zeros that you will get in that b times v will be smaller than um, um, uh, than than you know k times the number of of uh, elements in the set that you're representing, and this h function sort of compens compensates for that, and in an appropriate way for the expectation. And the thing is that the that the quantity in question is concentrated enough that you can apply this h function, you know, even without the expectation. And still get a get a quantity that's uh, get an estimate that's uh, appropriate. So so we have an analysis for how big a, a you know a bloom filter has to be in order to rep to support set intersection operations. Um, and here we we had to use a not not Bernstein's inequality, not McDermott's inequality, but a sort of Bernstein form of McDermott's inequality in the sense that. Um, we needed to be able to have properties that depended on the on lo on the variances of individual random variables and not on the, just on bounds on their their magnitude, but it needed to also take into account um, lack of uh, independence, but you know dependence between different random variables that we're analyzing. So uh, I think uh, I will skip the counting bloom filters, which has this curious expression analogous to high school algebra, but in terms of coordinate-wise minima and showing the coordinate-wise minima, minima can be used. And um, so, yeah, the, the, there's, there's no particular sense that any, any of the analyses that I've given are tight. Um, uh, 
And, and one problem here is that sort of for several of these, the, the order of operations is, is, is significant. Um, and map B is not actually, bundling is not actually associative. So, so you know, it's kind of difficult to, to, to think about, well, even in that case, um, even, you know, it's, it's difficult to, even on, on that basis. And there is that, that sort of exponentially fast forgetting that map B has. So, so all of these things presumably could be improved in some fashion. Um, and uh, one, one key thing here is not, is, is a, a need for, for an algorithm, which is a, a sort of a natural way to define uh, binding between two sparse binary vectors in a way that kind of preserves the right amount of sparsity, but is, but is also analyzable, is natural, and so on. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions for Ken? So, um, is there a sense of like where all the different functions or functionalities these um, primitive operations can have? Like, is there a sort of categorization of their powers? Like, you, you know, you st I'm saying consider the model where you start with these atomic vectors and you're only allowed to use binding, rotation, and so on. Right. Like, what can what can you do with it? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of the full extent of that. I, and, and I guess a, a sort of a different question would be how, to what extent can, can other data structures, you know, do the things that, that you know, what, what's, how does this compare to, against the competition for, for set representation and, and so on? And I don't, I don't have, a, have a good uh, answer for that. But I mean, you, in principle, you can, you know, for map I especially, you know, you could keep composing these things, however, you know, however you wanted, and and you know, you you you'd need to correspondingly increase the the sketching dimension, the the size of the atomic vectors. But you know, there's I don't think there's any particular limitation in in that respect. So is is my understanding correct? Like, it does a lot of things very like well, but oh, sorry, it doesn't do anything any particular thing very well, but it does a lot of things that. I, I guess you could put it that way. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not. I, I think the 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 motivation for for many people is this sort of biological connection, or that it's 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 not just that that it's a nice data structure, but it's a nice data structure that a fruit fly uses. You know. So so that that's something worth understanding. You know that. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what your attitude to fruit flies is exactly, but <laughs> I, you know they. So that's it. <clears throat> Any other questions for Ken? Uh, let's thank him one last time. <laughs>